Jesus, God, that we praise is the bedrock of our faith. He's the one in whom we trust and on whose word we stand. Come what may, let's sing out to him. Jesus Christ is my solid rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest phrase. joked this morning early about we're all a mess and we all have problems but I know it's real and I don't want to gloss over that we don't want to treat who you are and maybe the struggles that you're going through as though they were insignificant or something that we can be flipping about and 
the great news is that Jesus doesn't either. The psalmist tells us that the Lord is our shepherd and we have no need of want in our lives. But the truth is we have lots of struggle and lots of ache and pain, disappointment. You may have been through betrayal and you've come here through those doors today going, I'm going to give God, I'm going to give him one last chance. Some more good news. That same psalmist told us that the Lord would walk with us through the valley of the shadow. And in that valley, we don't have to fear the evil, the struggle, the pain, the betrayal, the anxiety. It's real and it is fearful, but we don't have to fear. Why? Not because we say some magic words and all of that goes away. Or not because we suppress it, but because Jesus Christ, Lord of heaven and earth, is with us. That's why we have no need of fear. That's why we can face the storms that come our way. And know that, as the hymn writer says, in every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds... I will not be shaken. The psalmist goes on to say at the end of that psalm, his last stanza is, Surely goodness and mercy have pursued me, gone after me, reached out to me all the days of my life. That includes all your days and all my days. The good days and the bad days, the, the days on the mountain and the days in the valley. And that pursuit is his best expression of his love for us. So as we come this morning broken and with problems, we can rest assured there is healing in our Savior's hands. We can know that his love is greater, broader, bigger, higher, deeper than anything we'll ever face. Let's sing out to him and rejoice. Keep us free. 
some of us this morning, we, we, we just need to be reminded of that fact. That even though we walk through the valley of the shadow, we are not alone. And God, those of us that are hurting for others, I pray that you will encourage us with the truth that you will never leave nor forsake anyone. And that there's nowhere anyone, even the people that we love dearly that are hurting so badly, there's nowhere they can go and be outside your love. So God, in this room right now, I pray that Holy Spirit, you would move. And some of us need to confess that we have a need of a Savior. We need to know you as our rescuing, reigning Lord. Heal our sin, God. And I pray we would courageously step out and take your hand and trust you. For those of us that know you that are struggling are hurting wondering maybe even fighting Lord may we courageously step out and take your hand and remember that you are always near remember that there is healing in your hands that, that you can walk us through these storms through these valleys and that because of that we need not fear we need not give up we need not be restless but we can trust you and God for those of us that are experiencing life on the top of the mountain May we remember that it's because of your love that we're there. Every good and perfect gift has come from you. And that as we rejoice in you, God of the mountain, God of the valley, God of the day, God of the night, that we would never forget that you are Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Life is easy when you're up on the mountain. You've got peace of mind like you've never known. But things change. And you're down in the valley Don't lose faith For you're never alone And the God on the mountain Is still God in the valley When things go wrong, he'll make them right. And the God of the good times, he's still God of the bad times. And the God of the day is still God. Is Oh. 
walk of faith when you're up on the mountain whoa and talk comes so easy when life's at its best but down in Thank you, Jerry. That's the way to start a sermon right there. That's good. Hey, good to see our uh, students back. They were at uh, camp last week. You'll have the opportunity at six this evening uh, to hear them. They're going to have a reflection time and uh, you'll be able to hear from many of them talking about uh, their uh, camp experience. And I know for many of them, it was a, a transformational week. I want us to open our Bibles this morning to, to John's gospel in chapter 12. And one of, the reasons I, one of the reasons I like preaching through, through books of the Bible, I think it's beneficial for, for us as students. I believe it's beneficial for you as a congregation to, to hear one book, the flow of a book, the theme of a book, different issues of, of a book. But, but one of the benefits that uh, for me as, as a pastor and as a uh, student of Scripture my, myself, and uh, I consider myself a lifelong student of Scripture, is that when you preach through a book, it forces you to deal with, with issues and topics and uh, passages that, that you might otherwise just, just avoid altogether whenever you're just kind of happenstance, jumping around week to week with no real uh, pattern of your, your preaching. It's very easy to, to come to a passage of Scripture in your devotional reading and go, whew, I'm never going to preach on that one. That's hard. And, uh, but the benefit of going through a book is that it forces you to deal with, with issues that you might otherwise uh, avoid. But in these, I think we find great uh, learning experience, uh, experiences. God certainly is not the author of, of confusion. And so I think uh, even on some of these troubling issues, I think we can find uh, clarity and encouragement uh, in our faith. This morning, I'm bringing a message entitled, The Grace of Nevertheless. The Grace of Never Never. The less. It's playing off of a key word that is found in this uh, passage of Scripture. It comes on the heels of a very uh, difficult and challenging statement uh, that John documents of uh, prophet, the prophet Isaiah. Jesus is near, uh, this is actually the last teaching of Jesus in his public ministry. The remainder of John's gospel will have to do with the time that Jesus spends with uh, his disciples, uh, teachings that uh, he has for them, things he wants them to understand. But, but as far as John's gospel, when we come to the end of chapter 12 here, this is the end of Jesus' public ministry. And in, in looking back over it, John says, but though he had performed so many signs in verse 37, but though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. 
There's kind of a frustration that very few have believed in him and his teaching. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, which, which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report? Isaiah had the same frustration of, of people not responding to his challenge of, of repentance. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason, they could not believe. For Isaiah said again, he has blinded, speaking of God, he has blinded their eyes and he hardened their heart so that they would not see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted and I, I heal them. We'll deal with that more in depth in just a moment. But that's a very difficult statement that's being made there. It appears that God, uh, and we'll address this, but it appears that God has taken an action to harden some people's hearts. Some people would point to this verse to uh, confirm a, a deterministic kind of predestination. That is that, that God has ordained it and uh, by God's design, some are destined, predestined for an eternal hell. Us, others are predestined for, for eternal life. And I hope to address that in a way that we can understand it in just a moment. But as the passage continues, and it's always important that you look in things in the full context, it's easy to, to find misunderstanding whenever you pull out an isolated verse. When you focus on one isolated verse like the one that I just read, it can lend itself to confusion. So what you have to do from an understanding standpoint uh, and interpretation, the task of interpretation, is to look at the larger context. What's the context of the passage? What's the context of the book? What is the context of Scripture itself? What is the message that is being, that is being put forth? And the larger message of salvation, the larger message of Scripture is that salvation is for anyone and everyone, for God so loved the world. You say, Bobby, what's the overarching message of Scripture? This is it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him, whosoever, anyone, whosoever believes in him shall have eternal life. That is the overall big picture message of Scripture. That is the purpose, the bottom line purpose of God's salvation history, that everyone might have opportunity to receive Jesus as Lord, Master, and Savior. But if you look at an isolated verse, it can cause a great deal of confusion. But in a larger context, what I see is God's grace working in this passage. Because as it continues on, he says in verse 42, nevertheless, Nevertheless, the purposes of God, the will of God, the desire of God that men might be saved continues to come forth. So even in the midst of, of mystery and confusion, even when there is a lack of understanding, we need to see preeminently grace standing out. Listen, there's nothing wrong with mystery. I'm always, I'm always taken back by, by people who have questions. Well, you know, there's, there's some confusion in the Bible. You know, that's why I don't believe there's, there's just a great deal of confusion. There's a, a great deal of contradiction. And uh, well, you know, why do we ascribe to theology an expectation that we have of no other field? It seems that theology is the one field where the unbelieving community insists on absolute clarity and understanding. It's an expectation that's unrealistic. It's an expectation that, that is not applied to any other ac academic discipline, so why theology? But what I want us to see this evening, this morning, is the grace of nevertheless. And I hope that in the midst of this message, we will find a, a greater understanding of God's salvation purposes, that by the end of this, that if you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, if you have never believed in him, that you would seize this opportunity. Because what I see in verse 37 is I see as my eyes, as my eyes as a believer and follower of Jesus Christ, as I read this passage of scripture and as I see grace jumping off this page, it begins here in verse 37 when I see grace for sign seekers. Now remember, Jesus at the end of his public ministry, John is evaluating this and says, but though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. Grace is available for those of you who are even seeking signs from God. You hear it as often as I do. Individuals say, well, if I just, you know, if I could see this, if I could see that, if I could just have a, if, if God would just show me a sign, then I, I would come to a place where, where I would be able to believe in him. 
And really the purpose of John's writing, as, you, as I've mentioned before, and really what, what gave birth to this, to this series through the book of John, the purpose for John's writings was to show you the things that Jesus did. In John chapter 20 and verse 31, he says, my whole purpose in writing is so that you might believe. Jesus did so much. He said so many things. He did so many things that, that the, there's not enough books to contain it. So John says, what I have done is I've taken significant events in the life of Jesus. I've taken stories from the life of Jesus, things that he said, things that he taught, miracles that he performed, and I've recorded these in a form and a fashion in the hopes that you will believe. And so he records the public ministry of Jesus, and as he comes to the end of it, as Jesus comes to the end, we see that there were very few who had believed. And yet there, there is grace for sign seekers. You see, for those, for those that are seeking signs, there, there's a biblical precedence. I mean, what, what, was, what was Thomas but, but a seeker of signs? You know, the announcement is made, he, he is risen, he's not dead, he's alive. Thomas says, no, nah, I won't believe it. I won't believe it. He's no different from, from a 21st century skeptic. Thomas said, Thomas said you know, I, 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 unless I can see his wounds, unless I can touch his hands, unless I, can, uh, unless I can put my hand into his side and feel the wound where the spear pierced his side, I simply will not believe. The Lord appears to the disciples again. Thomas is there this time. And his pronouncement is, my Lord, my God. The Lord said, Thomas, you believe because you got to see. Blessed are those who believe and yet do not see. And so we have to, have, we have to overcome at some point, we have to overcome this, this kind of 21st century notion that the reason you're, you're not believing is because God hasn't done enough to reveal himself to you. That if, that if God just did, if God would just jump through certain hoops for your benefit, if God would just do certain signs and miracles, you would believe. And yet what we find in, in scripture is that these kinds of signs never do really give birth to belief in faith. It never really does precipitate the kind of, of faith that, that Jesus is is looking for. In fact, you know what Jesus says of sign seekers? And we need to hear this today. You know what Jesus says of people who are always seeking signs in Matthew's gospel in chapter 16 and verse 4? He said, it's only an evil and adulterous generation that seeks a sign. And he said, a sign I will not give to them other than the sign of Jonah, three days, three nights in the belly of the whales, making a reference to the resurrection. It's only an evil and adulterous generation that, that's always putting God to the test, that is always demanding a sign. You want a sign? The only sign you're going to get is the sign of the resurrection. I mean, this is the sign of all signs. I mean, if you can't, if you can't embrace me after the resurrection, after what God has done in raising me from the dead, then no other sign will work. No other sign will make a difference. There's a wonderful parable that Jesus told that makes application of this. It's the parable of a rich man and Lazarus who was a pauper, a poor man. Both of them die. Lazarus goes into the, the bosom of, of Abraham and the rich man goes into the, into the torment of Hades. And the man in torment looks, about, looks across this vast chasm and, and sees Lazarus and he wants to come across. The Abraham says, no, you, you can't do this. And he says, at least send Lazarus. Because I have five brothers, at least send Lazarus and let him give them a warning. You know what Jesus says at the end of that parable? In verse 31 of Luke chapter 16, but he said to, to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, so they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. You say, I want a sign. I want to see, I want to see signs. Jesus said, even if, even if all the graveyards in Lubbock, Texas were to give up their dead, even if when we walked out of here today and you were to find your loved ones who have preceded us in death, even if you were to see them at Broadway and Avenue V and they, they're all standing out there saying, listen, y'all, I, I hope y'all don't take that sermon for granted. I hope you listened. I hope you'll get your life right. 
I hope you'll be serious about, about this commitment to me. Jesus said it wouldn't work. Signs do not elicit faith and belief. We seem to be a generation that is enamored with, with signs and, and looking for for proof, you remember, uh, it might have been about a, a year ago, there was some kind of uh, sarcophagus, some kind of box that, that had Jesus on the side of it that was discovered in some uh, archaeological dig and it had a set of bones inside and because they had Jesus on the side, all the, all the media picked up on it and said, there's speculation that they found the bones of Jesus. And I thought, this is absolutely ridiculous. And then this past week, They've discovered something and, and there's speculation that, that, it's the, that it's a piece of the cross upon which Jesus hung. Or we go out and we buy these, these books because somebody has, has, has died and had an apparent vision from, from, from heaven. Now they're going to tell us what, what heaven is like. What happened to the sufficiency of Moses and the prophets? We're always looking for some kind of sign they'll receive no sign. Jesus said, seekers of signs, it's an adulterous, evil generation. The only sign you'll get is the sign of the resurrection. What God has done in the person of Jesus Christ, that is the miracle of all miracles. And it places every one of us at a crossroads. Are you going to see how God has graciously worked in time and eternity in the giving of his son? Are you going to believe and trust in him or walk away? But I see grace in another capacity. I see grace working not just in the life of sign seekers, as, as grace worked in the life of Thomas, but I also see grace working in the life of hardened sinners. That's really what this, this passage is about in the verses I read just a moment ago. Verse 38, this was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, which he wrote, Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this they could not believe, for Isaiah said again, he has blinded, God has blinded their eyes, and he hardened their hearts so that, the, so that they would not see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted, and I heal them. Future tense, I will heal them. How do you reconcile that? I mean, that, that's, a, that's a legitimate tension. I mean, this is, I mean this, is one of those, this is one of those genuine mysteries of the faith that the finest theological minds have grappled with for, for over 2,000 years. So I'm certainly not going to resolve it. Bobby Dagnall here at Broadway and Avenue V on, on Sunday morning. But, but we have to be comfortable with, with mysteries and intentions in the life of the faith. Because when you read that verse, when you isolate it, when you pull it out of context, when you just read it in isolation, it seems to, it seems to create a notion and an idea that somehow God, it's this kind of deterministic predestination doctrine that God has ordained some for hell and he has ordained others. He has predestined some for hell. He has predestined others for heaven, for eternal life. The problem is, is that it doesn't fit in with the larger portrait of salvation history. Now, even going back in this same chapter in verse 32, just another example, Jesus said, and I, if I am lifted up from, from the earth, will draw all men, will draw all men to myself. That is, that is all people. What I'm doing is an act of grace and mercy. What I'm doing upon the cross, what I will do on the cross when I am lifted up, this is God acting in time and eternity so that all people from all walks of life will have the opportunity to respond in faith and trust in me. But there's a tension because it seems to, to create this idea that God has predestined some for hell and God has predestined others for, for heaven. How do we reconcile this? Well, let, let, me give you a couple, let me give you a couple of ideas that I have found help, helpful in my own study of Scripture. First ha the first has to do with the worldview. A lot of times we don't, we don't understand that the Bible is written out of a historical context. 
We, we talk about the Bible being inspired by God. That doesn't mean that, that the Holy Spirit zapped the writers into some kind of, of uh, catatonic state, that they had no control over their, their writing, that somehow they, they were just like zombies and God was moving their hand. Whoa, look here, I can't control this. You know, that, that's, inspiration means compelled to move, compelled to take action. You and I have both been inspired in life. That means we've been inspired. I've been compelled to take action to get involved. The biblical writers were inspired by the Spirit of God to write down the things that they had seen and heard. And as they wrote, they wrote out of their own experience. They wrote out of their culture. They wrote out of their, their worldview. And what we have to realize is that when you're talking about Old and New Testament, there's two, there's two tensions here in regard to worldview. Let me give you an example. I had a history professor by the name of Doyle Young, who I found to be the most helpful in understanding this kind of challenging, differing worldview between Old Testament writers and New Testament writers. Hebrews came out of a worldview. Let me give you an example of what it might look like. Let's say we have a group of, a group of Hebrews over here, all right? These stands right here are Hebrew people. That guitar is a Hebrew person. These group of stands and this guitar over here, these, these, these are people of a Greek culture, New Testament people, Greek, Greek culture. All right, let's, let's say that an automobile materializes right here. I snap my finger, an automobile materializes right here. Both groups are going to say, what's that? I'm going to say to them, this is an automobile. The Hebrew is going to ask, well, and then both of them will ask. The, the, but the Hebrews, for instance, will say, well, well, what's the function of an automobile? And I'll say the purpose of an automobile is to get you from point A to point B. They say, okay. That's good. This group over here, when I say, well, it's to get you from point A to point B, they're going to say, oh, yeah, but how's it work? Let, uh, how, what makes it go? How does it get from point A to point B? I'll, and I'll raise up the hood and I'll say, well, this, this is the engine. This is the engine. That's about as far as I can go. <laughs> this, this is an engine. And that, that's what makes it go. I say, no, it's just, it's static. It's just sitting there. Really, what, what makes it go? I said, well, if we, if we took off these manifold covers on either side, you would see that, that there's a set of, of pistons. And when they rotate, valves open, fuel comes in. There's a unique combination between fuel and, and air. And uh, these are connected to a drive shaft. And uh, I know you're impressed now. <laughs> and and these, these push the drive shaft and... They're like, wow, okay, now, now that I'm getting some questions answered. You and I are heavily influenced by the Greeks. Western culture, we are influenced by the Greeks and not by the Hebrews. You see the difference in, in their writing. Everything was caused by God in the Hebrew culture. That's why in Genesis 1-1, the Hebrew writer who was inspired to write about the creation account said that in the beginning, God created. The emphasis being that God is the agent acting in creation. How did he create it? That God did it. Okay, the Hebrews are satisfied with that. The Greeks are much more intrigued by this. Okay, in the beginning, God created, but how did he do that when they, sounds like our questions, doesn't it? Yeah, okay, but when did that really happen? Was that billions of years ago or was that 6,000 years ago? How did he do that? How does God create, create something out of nothingness? And what we do is we impose our Western questions, we, we impose our Greek questions on a Hebrew text that is not prepared to answer those questions. They didn't even get on their radar screen. And in the Hebrew, because God is the agent of life, because he's the giver of life, the creator of life, everything is caused by God. That's why when you come to the Old Testament, you find this tension. It says, God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Well, well is that deterministic? Well, from, from their perspective, perspective, because God is the giver of life, the sustainer of God, everything is caused by God. There's a tension in the, elsewhere in the text because it said Pharaoh hardened his heart against God. Which one is it? Well, in a sense, it's, it's both and, I guess. There's always this tension in Scripture between the sovereignty of God and the free will of man. That's one way of dealing with this, to eliminate the idea that this is some kind of deterministic, predestinarian doctrine that's found in an in a isolated verse of Scripture like this. Here's something else I've found helpful. 
A part of the misunderstanding of the confusion, I think, is because words like, words like determinism, uh, being uh, deterministic, words like predestination, words like election, are words that, that we can all say, we can all pronounce, but, but oftentimes we use, it's in our vocabulary, but we use a different dictionary. Does that make sense? Sometimes we ascribe definitions to a word that were never intended in the first place. And sometimes these, these words like, like determinism and predestination and, and election are, are wonderful biblical words. And I, and I understand them and appreciate them and I embrace them, but, but in a very broad way. I don't see a narrowing of salvation. I don't see a limiting of salvation. I see something that, that is very encouraging, something that is very comforting for, for the community of faith in these, in these doctrines because it shows that, that God is the one who is active in salvation. It shows that God has a plan and, and a purpose because in a sense, life is going to be determined by something. Your life is going to be determined by something. And I find great comfort in, 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 in the fact that, that God is a sovereign God, that God is a God who is involved in creation that God is a God who has a plan and a purpose for, for history, that, that history is, is linear, it's moving from a, from, a, from a beginning to an ending. That history isn't just this meaningless cycle that, that repeats itself. That's a, that's a secular, pessimistic worldview that just sees history moving in a cycle. I see history being lorded over by a sovereign God who is moving us from here to there. Your life is gonna be determined by something. If you don't embrace this idea that God has a plan and a purpose, then what you're left with is a life determined by nature. You're saying, oh no, I reject all that. So, okay, well then, then what you're left with is your nature. You're saying that life is random. You're saying that, that the product of your life is nothing more than your genes, your biology, or the way that you've been nurtured. I mean, that's a secular worldview that, that reduces your life and mind down to being nothing more than just another animal in the field. You're driven by your instincts. You're, you're, you're driven by your biology. That's the only hope you have. And that can become an escape route. That can become a cop-out. Well, you can say, well, what kind of chance did I have? Look at this, man. I, I had alcoholic parents. I came out of an abusive background. What kind of chance did I have? Or I had these circumstances around me and, and, and this kind of attitude was nurtured in me. But when we see God as having a plan and a purpose, it's in that that we find our, our meaning. And so a couple of things I say about this kind of, of passage in words like election and predestination, for me, they offer explicit comfort to believers. Words like election, predestination, determinism, these are not negative words. Somewhere along the line, they, they become misunderstood, they become interpreted in different ways. It's kind of like the word evolution. For the life of me, I don't know where the word evolution became such an anti-Christian word. I mean, we have to be smart enough to, uh, to, to, to see things what you say, well, are you, are you an evolutionist? Well, I, I'm smart enough to look into a microscope and, and see cells divide and something's evolving there. Now, I don't, I don't embrace evolution in the sense that it, that it means this narrow definition of, of evolution that some in the evangelical community embrace, that, that if you're an evolutionist, that you believe man evolved from, from fish, from fish in the sea. But just a rudimentary knowledge of cell biology, there's, there's evolutionary processes that, that are in place. So it comes down, are you going to have this isolated, narrowistic view of a word? Or are you going to allow it to have broader implications than you ever imagined? Because when I read in the Bible things about some sort of deterministic view by God, when I, when I read something about predestination or elect, I don't see this narrow perspective that limits salvation to being for some, but not for others. I see it as an explicit source of comfort for believers that our God is a God that is in control. That our God is a God who has a plan and a purpose in place. 
But what I also see, the second thing I also see when I, when I read those, those words and I don't see a narrow view, well, I see them as being an explicit source of comfort for believers. I also see it as being an, an implicit call to unbelievers. It's an implicit, when you read those passages of scripture, if you're not a believer, if it doesn't beckon you to believe, then I don't know what will. When you read these kind of, of passages, I mean, your thought ought to be, I, well, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna land there. I certainly, I, I certainly wanna respond to what God is offering, to the salvation that, that is available. But sin has a way, of when, when we don't embrace Christ as Savior, sin has a way of, of blinding our eyes. Sin has a way of, of hardening our heart. We're not even the, the voice of God can get through. And so there's, there's an implicit call in these passage of, passages of Scripture for, for believers. It's an implicit appeal to unbelievers to believe. And that's where we see grace at work. That even though these are hard words, listen, you can find grace in these verses because in the end, he said, and be converted, the end of verse 40, and I will, I heal them. It's looking ahead to a future action of God. Yes, their hearts are, their hearts are hard. Yes, their, their eyes are blind, but I will heal them. The writer Isaiah goes from third person plural to talking about the present condition of the people, looking ahead to the first person, to the, first, to the person of Christ, to a future activity, I will heal them. Even when hearts seem hard, even when eyes seem blind, he wants to perform a work of grace in your life. Very quickly, grace abounds also for fearful believers. Nevertheless, there's grace at work. Nevertheless, many, many even of the rulers believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. The synagogue was the hub of, of Jewish life. It was their school, it was their community. It, 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 it would, what, whatever place is important for you in your life, that's kind of the hub of your life, imagine being put out of that. And so these out of, out of fear, out of fear that they would be put out of the synagogue for they love the glory or the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Well, were they believers? Well, John, John says they were, Jesus says they were believers. Yeah, but they're, they're fearful believers. Are they really believers? Well, Apparently, you can be a fearful believer and still be a believer. It's not like over in John chapter 6 where you can be a disciple and not be a believer. You can be a learner and a student. He says to some of these disciples in John 6, they weren't believers. You can be a student, a learner, and yet not come to a point of being a believer in Jesus Christ. But this is different. He's, he says they're believers. But can you really be a fearful believer and, and be a believer? Well, you have couple of examples you have Nicodemus came to Jesus by night John chapter 7 he kind of makes a lame overture of supporting Jesus you have Joseph of Arimathea Joseph of Arimathea uh, who ultimately buried Jesus during the lifetime of Jesus Joseph nor Jesus nor uh, during the lifetime of Jesus Nicodemus nor Joseph of Arimathea they never made any really wholehearted overtures to believing and supporting Jesus. They were afraid. They were half-hearted. And so what Jesus is trying to do is to get fearful believers from, from moving to this point of being half-hearted to being whole-hearted for him, for him. And the reality is, I think most Christians today in Western culture, they're fear, fearful believers. The reason the church is so impotent is because of half-hearted half Christians out in the public square. 
Christians who are so concerned about the approval of men, trying to fit in with a certain crowd, a certain audience, they won't rebuke wrong. They won't stand up for justice. They won't stand up for principle. They won't be an advocate for the marginalized in our society because they worry more about the, about the approval and the glory of men. Listen, the approval of men can become your golden shackles. And so what Jesus is trying to do is to move them forward from half-heartedness to wholeheartedness. And Jesus cried out, verse 44, he who believes in me does not believe in me, but in him who sent me. Listen, don't think this thing about following me is about some little Galilean peasant that you're rolling the dice on. This is about what God is doing. That's what John is emphasizing with the signs that, uh, of Jesus' life. This is what God is doing. He says, you need to get off high center. Move from half-heartedness to wholeheartedness in your life. The disciples were afraid after the resurrection. Sometimes it's our own fear that, that holds us back. Sometimes we become indifferent. We're so familiar with the gospel. We take it for granted that Jesus died on the cross for us. We come Sunday after Sunday. It's really no transforming impact upon our lives, hearing messages and that really cause us to pause and stop and think and evaluate our, our lives. And you know, a lot of times we sit here and, you know, I'm looking down at the clock and sometimes we're just more, con more concerned that it's 12.05. You know, and I, I equate it to the, to the men who crucified Jesus. You think about those Roman soldiers. They're, they're rolling the dice. They're playing a dice game, casting lots. They're, they're playing a dice game. While, while three men are dying on a cross, I mean, it is such a, I mean, it's not a cute, pretty little piece of artwork. This, this is a heinous way to die. And they're sitting there rolling dice, playing games, while three men are hanging from, a cro from crosses. And, and most of us, we just portray these, well, they're just, they're just wicked, evil men. That's the reason they can do that. But I, I, I would bet that the first time a Roman soldier ever participates in a crucifixion, I bet he gets physically ill. I would bet that they got physically ill and I bet they couldn't sleep that night after they saw it. But what happens with the passage of time and repetition is they, they just became too familiar. They became indifferent. And maybe, that, maybe that's where, where some of you are. Maybe you've heard the good news so often. Maybe you've heard about grace so often that, that you just take it for granted. You just kind of become indifferent to it. It really has, has no impact upon your life. Or maybe there's, there's some of you here this morning and, and you really want to walk with the Lord. And you want, you want to give your life to the Lord and, and you want to begin pursuing him in your life, but you're thinking, you know what, I'm, I, man, I've just got things in my life I need to get straightened up. I, I, I just, man, I'm just not worthy right now. And, you know, I, I really need to get my act together. I want to challenge you to do something. Instead of looking at, instead of looking at your life through the eyes of your low self-esteem, I want to challenge you right now to look at your, your life through the eyes of of God's love. Stop looking at your life through the eyes of low self-esteem and start looking at your life through the eyes of God's love. It's a love that longs to extend grace. It's a love that longs to say, come. I know who you are. I made you. I know what you've been doing and I love you, and I want you to be my child. Nevertheless, let's pray together. Our Father, we're grateful that even as we read difficult and challenging verses in your word, we can find your grace prevailing over all. 
a grace that calls us, a grace that beckons us, a grace that, that challenges us to, to pursue you and to live our life for you. And Father, I pray that as we extend this invitation this morning, that Father, as we examine our own hearts, we would look at our lives not through the prism of our own low self-esteem, but that we would see ourselves through the window of your love. And that we might receive that which you so desperately long to give. Life and purpose and meaning. Stir in our hearts even now. Convict the sinner, the hardened sinner to come. Convict the sign seeker that the sign has been given in the resurrection. Convict the half-hearted to become whole. Let us hear the words of Jesus in our mind. Do not fear, I am with you. Even so, come. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. For more information about First Baptist Church, give us a call or visit us online at firstlubbock.org. Download our mobile app to experience even more from FBC. Check out our other worship times, Sundays at 8.15, 9.30, and 11 a.m. Experience these online or come visit us at Broadway and Avenue V in Lubbock. Thanks for watching. God bless and have a great week.